So on uh, Tuesday night, I saw Greg at uh, our Cantori rehearsal, funny, and we were in line getting ready for our, uh, our current uh, concert preparation, music, and receiving that, and he, he saw me, he goes, Samuel, can you do me a favor? And he said it so joyfully and quickly, I thought, well, this, sure, I probably need a ride home. <laughs> Not. He goes, you know, I had an opportunity, I got a call to uh, participate up in uh, Fresno at the big Fresno church. They're having a reunion of all the pastors, and I was a pastor there, and could you take the pulpit for me, Sabbath? Click, 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 click. Honestly, there was a little delay, all right? And I thought, well, that gives me uh, three days to get ready. Now, interestingly enough, he knows that I just sat through uh, a lecture he gave a week ago today on preaching and preparation, because as an elder and as a, a member of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you never know when you're going to be called to say something, right? So I went to his class on how to get things ready, and one of the things that stuck in my mind that he said was, you know, you should plan on about an hour of preparation for every minute you talk. <laughs> so I took that home with me, and then I'm thinking now, I have three days to, to cram uh, all this in. How am I going to fill all that time? So here's what I promise you. I've prepared in these three days... Uh, the three-day suit message for three-day blind sinners. All right. That didn't go over too good. Okay. That was my attempt. And I didn't get paid for saying those things. You'll notice that the uh, sermon title today is, I am willing to be. It doesn't say, I want to be. Now, if you've heard me talk before, you realize that there were many things as I grew up that I wanted to be. The first thing I wanted to be was a frontiersman. That's right. Coonskin hat, Davy Crockett, that kind of frontiersman. That's the way I wanted to live. That's what I wanted to do. That's what was important to me. And every moment of my free time was focused on how I could get out to the wilderness until I got to the wilderness. And I realized that that lifestyle wasn't really going to make it. So then I said, I know what I want to be. I want to be an engineer. Now, not the kind of engineer that Chris is. Not one with a lot of technical knowledge and expertise and making sure that structures are correctly built and engineered and wrote roads are prepared, I wanted to be a train engineer. Now, I had an in. My father worked on the railroad. And so, I was one of the lucky five, six, seven, and eight-year-olds that got to ride on trains, to be up in the engine, to be in the caboose, to be on top of the caboose, to listen to all the stories, to pull that big horn, to feel that power. Man, that was good. Well, I was quickly disappointed because in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, the demise of the railroad and the slowdown, and no longer were we going to ride the big uh, railroad uh, cars and the chiefs and the, all, all of the, the, the train extravaganzas anymore across the country and they weren't hauling things and trucks and airplanes were taking over all transportation so that slipped away from me well then I said I want to be a preacher and after today you'll know why that didn't get fulfilled <laughs> okay but there was a period of time I wanted to be a preacher then I found out it took, you know, one hour preparation for every one minute. Ruled that out. 
So I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'm pretty good at sports, so I want to be a professional sports player. Now, I will say I was pretty good in the day. And there was a call one day, said, we heard about this, this guy that could throw that football, and University of Texas El Paso was interested in someone, and they wanted me to come see them, see if I could be on team. Hey, Division One, that's pretty good. But then God said, wait a minute. You know what that means, Milt? What are you going to do with the Sabbath? So that went away, and I chose a different path. I went back to ministry and then didn't finish that, and then now here I am just doing whatever I do. My son tells me uh, when he was growing up, I worked in hospitals. He said, I want to be like you, Dad. What I want to do is do what you do. Walk around the halls of the hospital, get paid $5 an hour, and enjoy life. That's what I did. It can be so easy. What are you willing to be? So, anyone out there, when they read the title of the sermon, I am willing to be, did something come to your mind right away? I'm willing to be, sure, Christ's follower, interesting. And you know what? That's where we're going to start pretty soon today, right there. So, good. Anybody else want to share? Yes. Missionary? I'm willing to be a missionary. If someone would just call me up, plant me in a place, and I'm ready to roll. Beautiful. I saw a hand over here. Willing to be used of God. Anybody else? I heard something. Oh, I'm sorry, Paula. My ears... I'm willing to be of service. Oh, boy. Well, it sounds like people have a pretty good idea what we're going to talk about today. Now, when I, uh, when I was in uh, getting out of high school and into, uh, into college, you know, there's this thing called the Army. You know about the Army, don't you? Right? And I, re- and I remember, the, do you remember the motto of that, that period? Late, late 60s motto, what's that? Looking for a few good men, hmm. Here, how about this? Between World War I and 1950, the Army motto was, I want you for the U.S. Army, right? I want you for the U.S. Army. Now, they were competing against... Navy, Air Force, Marines. I'm going to use the Army. No offense to anyone's Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. No offense. Between 1950 and 1971, this was the first motto that they were trying to hook me up on. Look sharp, be sharp, go Army. Look sharp, be sharp, go Army. I said, well, I look pretty sharp. And I am pretty sharp. Then, the problem I had with that was the pictures from Vietnam were coming back over, right? And it didn't look like looking sharp, be sharp. It was a nasty time. But anyway, that was our motto. And then the one people may be more familiar with today, be all you can be. Then there, between 2001 and 2006, they changed their motto again. Now we're volunteer army, right? It's a volunteer. Army of one. Belong. Belong. Army of one. Belong. That's the message they wanted to give. And then the current one, army strong. Do those sound like good calls to you? Now, there was a period, a short period where my friend said, I am going to join the army because I want to be a demolition expert. Really? I want to be a demolition expert. And he joined the army. What do you think he ended up doing? What's that? 
peeling potatoes are pretty close. Pretty close. Yeah. He worked in uh, warehouse resources. You see, when the army calls you, they tell you what you're going to be based on the needs they have. Now, when you join, everyone starts in the same place. doesn't matter how much money you have or don't have. doesn't matter how big or small. doesn't matter anything about you. Everybody starts the same, and you go through the same program, and you organize the same. But when it's all said and done, you be what the Army wants you to be. I would like to have flown an airplane. That doesn't work for me. Right? Doesn't work. Too tall. There's no promise of what you want. What the army says is that this is what you will be, and you will be the best at it. Does it matter to you the difference between wanting and willing? <clears throat> My dad was in the Navy. He said there was something interesting about military because you're pegged in certain places. He was on a destroyer. He served on two destroyers for about two and a half years in World War II. And he shared a lot of stories with me. Some were funny, some were not. Really interesting. One of the things he shared with me is, you know what? I became friends during that two and a half years with a lot of people, but specifically I remember 12, about a dozen uh, gunners who would sit on the destroyer. And their job, that was their job, shoot guns. Whatever size, he knows all the sizes. You know, I don't know what the sizes are. This millimeter, that millimeter, this whatever. That's what they did. And he said, of the 12 or dozen gunners, 10 of them were from either Oklahoma or Arkansas. Now, I wonder why they got to be gunners over the people from California, New York. They brought something with them. They brought a base of experience with them. They were good. In fact, my dad said, hey, guess what? Um, I used to sit outside. He, my dad was a corpsman. He, he could sit inside and wait for people to get hurt and help them on the ship. That's what a corpsman does. But he decided to sit outside by the gunners and watch them. So, not my cup of tea. What am I willing to be? Let's, uh, let's look at our text. The first one this morning from the Old Testament, Isaiah 1, 18 and 20. There's an invitation that God has. It's not a slogan. doesn't say, come be all you can be, per se. doesn't say, look smart, be smart. There's an invitation in Isaiah. He says, come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. If... You are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. God gives an invitation. And what's his requirement to you, the hearer of this invitation? Are there any requirements? willing. If you're willing, if you're willing, come sit with me and let's reason together. Now, for years I read that reason together and I, and I like sitting down in, in Sabbath school, for instance, and talking about things, reason with people, share different ideas and whatever. But in this context in Hebrew, it's more serious than that. God says, when he says, come, let us reason together, 
He's saying, I'm willing to give all. You put all on the table. Bring your total self. Put it all out there. This is what we have to talk about. Because there's a journey that's going to take place. It isn't about a single day. It's about a journey. He goes, I promise forgiveness. Doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, where you've been, or what you're doing. I will forgive and forget. I will make you a new person. Yes, white as snow. If you are willing to let me lead and are responsive to this leading, the word obedience comes in. If you're willing to take this journey with me, that's my call. What do you think of that idea? If you call yourself a Christian, you've started the journey. You've laid it all out on the table. You've bared yourself to Christ and said, Hey, Christ, I'm here. I'm willing. Let's do it. Now, sometimes, and by let's do it mean let's start on that journey. A journey means it's day to day to day, right? So I will be honest with you. When, when my life is going fairly smooth, and it does a lot of the time, God is good. I don't always remember that that day I have to put things back on the table, that I have to reason with God again, right? And it's easy sometimes for me to go a little while before I have that one-on-one -on -one serious moment. But I tell you what, when things get tough, something happens, a little challenge or whatever, there, you know where I am first? I'm talking to God. I don't know what it, it's like in your life. I'm trying to get over that type of porpoising of my relationship with God. I don't think God wants things to go wrong just so I continue to be closer to Him. He promises a pretty smooth sailing process for the most part if you're engaged in His journey. Not that it's perfect, your life will be perfect or without problems, but he is there to rest on. God has called us with this uh, opportunity to reason with him, just like he called his disciples. His disciples had a call. Let's look at our, our New Testament text in Matthew. Matthew 4, 18 through 22. Well read, by the way. Thank you very much, everyone. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. What were Peter, Andrew, James, and John willing to do? What's that? Leave everything. They were willing to leave and be... What? And be led. They were willing to follow Jesus. They were willing to, whatever it meant to be a fisher of men or a fisher of people, whatever that meant, they were willing to, to learn about that. And they were willing to leave their work, their assets, their family, and friends. They decided to say to Jesus, I am willing to to be led. Does that make sense to you? Hmm. I wonder what they knew about Jesus. How about this? If I stood here today and said, all right, everyone, I, I'm 
willing to spend four days in the wilderness and you follow me and you'll be okay. So let's go. Who's going to raise their hand and follow me? Let me lead them in the wilderness. Desert? Downtown L.A.? <laughs> Streets of Santa Clarita? Does it make a difference to you who's calling to be the leader? What does it mean, accept authority, trust in the leader, and an expert? How do you define an expert? Do you think uh, Peter, James, John, Andrew thought that Jesus was an expert? What, what was it that allowed them to buoy their faith and leave what they had and go? What did they see? What did they know? We weren't there. We don't know. We can only assume. But the call today that Christ makes is the same. Come reason with me. Follow me on this journey. Are you willing to consider to put everything on the table and be what God wants you to be and not necessarily what you want to be? Now, we know the story of the disciples. We know their journey. For three and a half years, they were with Christ. Did they do everything right? Knowing the stories, do you believe they knew what they were really getting into? They didn't, did they? They were surprised. Hey, I'm willing to follow you, Lord, because you said you are the king. I am willing to follow you, Lord, because I saw you do a miracle. I'm willing to follow you, Lord, because you said that there's a new kingdom, and you're the top of the kingdom, and I want to be part of it, and I'm ready to go. Little did they know what that meant. So I want to take a few moments. It sounds like most all of us are willing to say, I am willing. But let's see what the disciples had to learn as they went on that journey. Last week we had the uh, communion service. The Last Supper and the foot washing. And that's the first thing that came to my mind that the disciples really struggled with a concept of being humble. When they took off on their journey with Christ, I don't think first in their mind was, I'm willing to be humble. From John 13 we read, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You called me teacher, you called me Lord, and rightfully so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I am willing to be humble, Jesus said in that act. Are you? Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. There's another story that took place in Luke chapter 18. People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. Hey, get away. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. The disciples had to learn to be 
to say, I am willing to be childlike. That was a little contradictory to where they were at that time. What about you? In John chapter 13, Jesus is asked, all right, we like to talk about obedience and commandments and all those kind of things and measure ourselves. The disciples were in that mode. They were willing to stand up to anyone as far as taking care of business and keeping the law. Jesus said, wait a minute. Can you say, I am willing to love and be loved? From John chapter 13, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Matthew 5, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you, going, what are you doing more than others? Don't even pagans do that? Be perfect as your Father is in heaven. They had to learn to say, I am willing to love and be loved regardless of who the others are. There's another story that took place that was another awakening for the disciples. Jesus was traveling along and he entered Jericho. This is in Luke 19. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead, climbed in a sycamore tree, or sycamore fig tree, uh, to see him, since Jesus was coming his way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. The disciples had to learn to say, I am willing to be a friend to those who are new, that I don't know, who may be different. Jesus said to them, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. God calls everyone his children. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save those who have been lost. Do you see the journey the disciples going on? We're walking on the same journeys, friend, the same journey. There's another story, an example that the disciples had to learn. It's more than just willing to be led They had to learn to say, I am willing to be helped. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him it was Jesus of Nazareth who was going by. He called out, Son of David, Son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet Jesus was coming by, don't bother him, but he shouted even louder, Son of David, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Uh, I'm blind. Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus. I am willing to be helped.
Early on in, in Christ's ministry, we're told another story. Disciples had to learn a lesson, what it meant to be led. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed, this is in John 6, crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, and a great crowd of people followed him because he saw the signs, because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up to the mountains and sat down with his disciples. The Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up, he saw a great crowd coming toward him. He said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered, Honestly, it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each of these people to have even one bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will that go among so many? Jesus said, wait, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and so they sat down. Over 5,000 were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed it to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had had all they wanted to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather everything that's left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets and, uh, with pieces of uh, barley loaf and the leftover fish. Jesus wanted the disciples to know that they needed to be willing to say, I am willing to be prepared. I need to be thoughtful in where I'm going. I need to think forward to look ahead. I need to be part of a solution and not involved in a problem. I am willing to be prepared. In Matthew 25, it says, The king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my, blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, Whatever you did for the one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. The disciples needed to learn to say, I am willing to be active in the good news. I am willing to work. I am willing to give. I am willing to assist. I am willing to be part of the kingdom with my brothers and sisters. I am willing to be active. In John chapter 14, we're familiar with most of these verses. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have not told you? I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Hey, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. The disciples, after spending all this time, had not caught on to the concept of trust. They needed to be able to say, I am willing to to be faithful. I am willing to know you, Lord. The journey that the disciples took, they realized was more than just being led, more than just hanging out with a great teacher, more than just going to synagogue with Jesus, more than just watching miracles. The journey had purpose. Does your journey with God have purpose? Is it more than just coming to Sabbath school and church? Jesus called them to be more than what they wanted to be. Jesus called them to be everything they could be each with their own talents. Jesus called them into a partnership where the greatest desire was to be all that God wanted them to be. So what's your journey? And Jesus calls you today. He calls you to come and reason together. Put it all on the table. Let's hash it out. Make a decision where we're going. He calls you to leave your unnecessary baggage. He calls you into a trust journey, a relationship, and he promises he will never stop working in your life. So what are you willing to be? I am willing to be led on a personal journey. I am willing to be a humble servant to others. I am willing to have a childlike attitude towards new knowledge in Christ. I am willing to be loving to others. I am willing to be a friend to all. I am willing to be helped by God and the Holy Spirit. I am willing to be prepared for what God has for me in my life. I am willing to be active in God's work. I am willing to share the good news. I am willing to be faithful to the one and only God of heaven. From Galatians, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. Are you willing today to say, I am willing, Lord, 
to be just exactly what you want me to be.